Welcome to Brain Behaviour Business Podcast, brought to you by Prison Brain Mapping, the online behavioural profiling tool. David Meller, mentor and entrepreneur with over 25 years experience in the commercial and investment banking world, joins Alex Eade from Prison Brain Mapping to discuss the sequel to his From Crew to Captain trilogy of books. Retirement or even semi-retirement may be a pipe dream, but David's changing tack books create a fun and engaging Bible to support reflection and planning. Based on his own extensive experience, David's insights and advice will help fast track the transition from working to semi-retirement or from semi-retirement to full retirement. Good morning, David, and uh, welcome back to Prison Brain Mapping. Obviously, been here a few times before talking about uh, various books and uh, ideas that you've had. So, for those that haven't met you before, just uh, a short, sharp introduction about you and, and where you are currently. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Alex, and good morning to you also. Um, I, uh, career wise, uh, when I graduated from Cambridge, um, I I'm so old, I worked for Midland Bank and joined them as a graduate <laughs> trainee. Uh, I now, remember them. Now HSBC, of course. Uh, I had 14 years there. And for the only time in my life, I got headhunted uh, in 1990 to go and set up a new business for Deutsche Bank in London, which was very exciting. Um, 2001, I decided that um, the time was right to... Uh, to exit the banking sector and I set up my own business. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 25 years in investment banking, one way or another. And so for the sort of 20, 21 years after that, uh, I built a portfolio career which had three main components. Um, there was uh, mentoring people, predominantly people who were setting up their own business. Uh, did quite a lot of work for what was known as CAS Business School, now mm -hmm. Bayes Business School. Uh, around entrepreneurship, corporate entrepreneurship and sales with both the student community and the executive education community. And off the back of what I was learning from those two parts of the portfolio, uh, I, uh, I published nine books on different aspects of starting mm. and growing a business. So in tweet length, it's a mentor, lecturer and author. <laughs> and um, I in, I'm into month five of retirement. Month five of retirement, yeah. great. And so it, I mean, so it sounds like David, we, retirement has been, it's been a long time coming, shall we say? Oh yeah, it was a bit like breeding elephants. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I started thinking about it when, um, when I was about 59, I think. And my, my initial game plan was to go down to uh, a three day week, a four day week at uh, 60, and then a three day week at 65, and then to hang up my boots at 70. Right, right. And, and what happened as a consequence? What happened as a consequence? Um, well, um, I think I, uh, I completely stuffed up the attempt to go down to a four day week. Uh, I think the main reason was I was having far too much fun doing what I was doing. Right. Because I was working right. by and large with people I liked uh, and um, doing interesting work and being paid for it. So it doesn't get any better than that. Very good. And, and so I think there was a disconnect between the what I had set out as my game plan and what I actually executed. And those, or that theory, that, that element of what happened, yep. form the basis of the two books that we're going to talk through today, Changing Tack 1 and Changing Tack 2. But before Correct. we do that, yep. um, just talk me through so uh, the sort of business life cycle that encompasses how you came upon the ideas for your previous books and, and what they entail. So, so just briefly cover that for me, if you okay. would. Yeah, well, the, the first book, which um, came out in, I think it was 2010, uh, was called From Crew to Captain. And it was prompted by a lot of work I was doing with people who had um, been made redundant and uh, weren't looking for another job. They were looking to set up their own business. Mm -hmm. And I was running some workshops about how, how do you do that. And uh, I was persuaded by several different interventions to uh, from different people to sort of convert the classroom material into a book. So it, it really is all about how you make that transition uh, from working for a big organization to working for yourself. Yes. 
So that was the uh, that was the first one, mm -hmm. and then uh, ironically, through some research done by a business school um, student who um, was using me as a case study, um, it transpired that about unknown to me, about seventy percent of the people that I had been helping uh, were setting up as consultants or similar. They didn't right. want to go and open a funky wine bar or write an app really? uh, they, they they wanted to make money out of what they knew and so I thought ah and so having got the the bloodlust from the first book uh, I, I wrote a second book called Privateer's Tale which is like a niche version of the first one so how do you make the transition from a big organization to setting up as a consultant right yes um, and then I thought at the time I thought this needs closure of some sort so what about the people you know who prove to themselves in the market their model works and they want to take the business to the next level? Um, so I did a book called Sticking with the Nautical Theme. I did a book called Command of the Fleet. So that's how how do you move from being an owner manager to building a business which is bigger than you, capable of sustainable, profitable growth? Yeah. And yeah. so that that became known as the Cruder Captain Trilogy. Yeah, all right. And we've covered those before. Yeah, we've covered those. So we've, we've, yeah, yeah. we've uh, all the podcasts are available on normal yep. on normal platform. Yep. So crew to captain and private to tell commander of the fleet. Yep. We, we've we've yep. covered before, uh, uh, and so that moves from startup yeah. looks at consultancy, but looks at growth around yep. around those two. Yep. So uh, the the next two steps in your business yep. cycle, which is we're going to cover today, are labelled easing back. Yeah. <laughs> and retiring. Yep. So tell me about easing back, which I presume is changing tack book one. Correct. Um, this, uh, I decided that there was looking at people out there who, um, you know, were sort of, uh, they were on the way to approaching retirement, if you like, rather than having retired. Most of the um, advice and guidance they were getting from their uh, you know, from their contacts or from mm -hmm. their employers was around tax, pensions, finance. Right. It was precious little about anything else. So I thought, ah, maybe the next stage of what I could do is, um, in terms of, say, a business life cycle, is something around how do you go from working flat out uh, to sort of part time, right? Which yeah. was was becoming increasingly popular. Mm -hmm. Less and mm -hmm. less people were going from being bonkers busy to doing nothing. Yes. So I thought, well, that's where I am. So um, I had, uh, you know, sort of uh, come up with this idea that at, you know at sixty I would go down to a four day week, and then uh, as I said, sixty five I'd go down to a three day week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was to cover that period, and I got it. I made so many mistakes. It <laughs> It's like a disaster movie in print, um, and um, it, um, oh, in an indirect way, we'll come back to that. It did, it did help me out, but it was something which I sort of blundered into rather than having a very clear, you know, plan as to you know as to how I was going to do it. Um, and I thought I ought to share this because a people like reading disaster stories. Um, <laughs> As I know from my business school, um, my business school work, the, uh, the delegates and the students loved a case study where something has gone horribly wrong, yes, as opposed yes. to a case study when it's all, all gone, gone smooth right. as silk. <laughs> so, um, and the, the key thing I wanted to do, therefore, was I, I, I catalogued 30 lessons I'd learned in trying to do this transition. Um, but I, I wanted it to be bigger than just my view of the world, so I got 30 other people to make contributions so that this issue of moving to semi-retirement, um, you know, it was it was seen through many different lenses, yes. not just me. Yes. Uh, and it was people who were contemplating it, people like me who were doing it, and people who'd done it and come out the other end. Oh, right. So okay. there was, there was kind of like a balance. Good mix. And uh, it was very helpful in terms of, in particular, looking at, um, looking at the options that you have um, in terms of making that, uh, you know, that transition and easing back, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of just going down to a four day week in what you've always done. Um, yes. Sort of, uh, I think what the youth call side hustles, setting up a <laughs> side hustle, that's something you've always wanted to try. Uh, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, so that was um, that was easing back. So it's, it's thirty lessons that I learnt right. um, in terms of how, you know what not to do as much as anything. Uh, but 
reinforced by other people's contributions. Yeah. So we could rename it David's Book of Mistakes then, rather yeah. than changing. Oh, changing thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 you're, yeah. you're most welcome. <laughs> most welcome. You're too kind. <laughs> so we haven't got time to yeah. go through all no, no, the no. 30 lessons yeah. today, but yeah. I guess, David, for you, there must be some that are more poignant than others. Uh, yeah, I think, I think there are. Um, I think there's probably three I would mention. The first one and the biggest one, I think, is time management. Uh, because it's it's really in your hands, and so how are you going to organise your your life in terms of? Um, cause obviously, it's a different routine. Yes. In terms of the number of days you're going to work, what you're going to do with the other days, uh, and so I think the time management one. Uh, I mean, one of the the lesson that I wrote down in the book was, um, you know. Don't try and cram five five days in work into three. You know, it doesn't mm, happen. Mm, Something's mm, got to give. Um, mm. And you can almost con yourself if you're not careful that you're doing it okay, but you're not. Um, second one, so the time management one was number one for me. And the number two was probably finance in terms of, you know, if you are going to go down to a four-day or a three-day week, um, that presumably means that your revenue is going to go down or your income. So how are you going to sort of uh, reduce your costs so that you can keep the same sort of net, yes. net amount coming in? Yes. So it's first baby steps in thinking like a pensioner, basically. Right. How am I going to make this work? Yeah. Um, and then the third one, and this was, this was really important, and I didn't want to become over analytical about it, but I set up a little kind of table um, with 10 measures in it, five business, five personal, which I used to track on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And I had to be honest, so each month I would put in what what my percentage score was against each one. Yeah, so right. if I got 100%, then I'd hit every one of them. Yes. I said, and so the business ones included level of revenue, level of cost, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, on the personal ones, it was, uh, the time management one was how many, I, I measured it by month, not a week. How many days work had I actually done that month? And you know, I had I couldn't cheat. So days I worked at home had to be included. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was targeting coming in uh, over, um, or, or to be fair, the lesson I learned on this one was to, was to introduce this and get it right. But my target was sort of, uh, to come in under 12 days a month. Right. Uh, work. Work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, and some of the some of the personal ones were, uh, don't laugh, improving my ukulele playing, uh, <laughs> getting my golf handicap down. You know, improving your ukulele music. playing. Yeah, I'm the world's worst musician, but I love music. <laughs> and the ukulele is, is, I've got stubby little fingers. So the ukulele is quite easy compared to a guitar because there's only four strings. So, right, okay. Yeah, so. But incredibly hard to produce a good sound from Absolutely, and there's no way I do it in public. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, no, it was, it was good. Good. Well, and, next, next time we meet, you must bring the ukulele with you. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Shouldn't have told you that one. Um, but those, those, me those measures became increasingly uh, important, uh, right. you know, in terms yeah. of, because it meant that each month you could take remedial action if there was one where you were slipping. Yeah. Yes. So, so moving down yeah. to twelve days. Yeah. That was a that was a gradual process. Um, yeah, because over the period from because it's something I really continued where you know from uh, you know when I was when I decided what I had to start getting right rather yes. than stuffing up, which yeah. is leading up to that's probably two thousand and nineteen when you know, when I was approaching um, sixty five. Um, but the the moving yeah it it started off. You know, at about 14 days, then I got down to 12. And by the time I finally retired at the end of last year, I'd got it down to below eight, I think. Good grief, right. But you had to, you had to be, you had to measure it. And every now and again, you'd get a surprise in terms of, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I think that the measures, the measures was really important. And that balance between family ones, your personal ones and business ones, five of each. Yeah. So each had an equal weighting, up yeah. to, you know, adding up to 100. Mm, very good. And and hot tips for time management, what would they be? Uh, well, beyond having the measures to make sure you're carrying yes. it out. Um, well, I think the key thing was really being clear in your own mind what um, 
what you wanted to spend your time right, on. Right, okay. So going yeah. through the portfolio of activities and deciding which of these do I really care about and which could I exit gracefully. Um, resigning from non-exec directorship positions if I think I'd serve my time. Yes. Um, resigning from trade associations and committees and networking groups if I thought there's not much point in me being in groups where one of the key purposes is business development mm. and new business generation when I'm not, not I'm looking there. to reduce it not, mm. in, not increase it mm. um, uh, so and also trying to cluster cluster time so if I decided bear my lived down in Horsham in Sussex if I decided I was going to spend a day in London trying to put as many meetings in that day as I could so I wasn't going up to London three for three days with one meeting mm. each day that I could get all three on the same day yeah so yeah so just little things like that yeah good good excellent so that leads us on to the final book yep so David's final book of mistakes Oh, or, or, <laughs> as, as is you're also too, known, you're, you're too kind. <laughs> Changing tack, yep. book two. Yep. So, uh, how does the book come about, and, and I guess what's it all about? Mm. Well, this this was um, this was for people who either like me had gone through this semi-retirement before they reached retirement, and people who are going to just do it at one fell swoop. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it was really all about do you understand what you're getting into uh, and how you're going to deal with it and the the big thing I'd learned from the mistakes in the, when, I'm between, when I was between 60 and 65 the really big thing I learned was I needed to have and agree a sort of psychological contract as I called it with myself mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of right this is the plan uh, and this is the way I'm going to do it and so creating a, a, a transition plan for this last stage and making sure that I had done my homework before I started it and then again having measures that would demonstrate I was sticking to it. Right, yeah. Um, and, you know, and it was basically benefiting from all the mistakes I'd made in terms of using this second chance to, to get it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, the, uh, that was the big thing. So it was in terms of who, who would be interested in that, anyone, come, anyone who was trying to do that second stage or, I said, the big stage going from you know, full-time employment to nothing. To nothing, yeah. I, I think one of the big lessons I learned was that there is still retirement out there with a small R rather than the capital R because so many people carry on doing something uh, either related to what they were doing before or something they've always wanted to do because there was a growing understanding which you'd appreciate that it helps enormously to keep your brain active yeah absolutely and i think doing crosswords and sudoku is not enough no 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 you know so having something that gives you a reason to get up you know beyond going for walks or playing golf or whatever i think is quite important mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be voluntary work for some people it is mm -hmm. um uh, i mean for me i do uh, work through the company of entrepreneurs which is one of the city uh, institutions yes uh, and in my case it's predominantly in schools to help children believe that they have a future you know uh, yeah, perfect. and to, to kind of inspire them so that, that's kind of my giving something mm, back to the community mm, mm, mm. um so you know i think that was all you know that was all really important to me and the uh, the psychological contract was a key thing because i think if you've got the psychological contract and you've worked out your transition plan um it's much easier to rebrand yourself and have a an identity and a purpose which is probably different from what you've had for your previous working mm -hmm. career mm -hmm. so uh, what what sort of things are in your psychological contract? What, what's in it? Um, I think the things that you can divulge. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it, again, going back to the lessons I learned uh, in the first five years, um, a lot of it was being absolutely crystal clear on what I would do and what I wouldn't do. Right. Uh, learning, le being much better at saying no and feeling okay about it. Yes. And also um, being sensible about what I was exiting. So there were two, two of my clients. One I'd mentored since uh, 2001 and the other one I'd mentored since 2012. And they were both at stages with their respective businesses where there was a big change coming. 
and there's no way they could effect that change to time with my selfish retirement plans. Mm. And mm. I wouldn't have felt good <laughs> saying to either of them, well, I'm off now, may your God go with you. you know? yeah. So I'm working with them, I love them both to bits, they're great people to work with, very professional, and um, I care about them. So, and they're not high maintenance. Yes. So, yes. so that is all quite good. Um, and then uh, something I'm still doing for a couple of my uh, my clients is helping them with their work using Prism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because again, that's kind of I can do it from home yes. most of it. You know, I don't have to be charging around the country. Um, so, you know, that was that. And then I was uh, going to spend more time playing golf uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, we've got like a, a husband and wife membership of English Heritage and National Trust, so mm -hmm. making sure we exploited that, yes. uh, which you could now do during the week, it didn't have to be a weekend, yeah. Uh, yeah. because it's a great way to spend some, some of these places are fantastic, I know. I know. and it's a great way to do something together you know, yes. and yeah. that we both enjoy. So it was coming up with this, uh, this contract that had all these different components. Yeah, very good components in it very good and uh it's it's really worked well so when the psychological contract hasn't been met yeah what are the penalties that you impose upon yourself <sighs> being harder on myself in the following month right. because again i look at it each month yeah yeah and again you know there are you know there are measures um and it's not a, it's not a bureaucratic process you know mm. it's mm. um you know, um, it, it's down to, you know, must try harder. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's going pretty well. And the, the, the other important thing is that, you know, I'm into month five now. Um, there is still stuff that is, if you've run your own business as I did, you can't just unwind it overnight. No. It's not like being an employee where you just, you know, hand in your notice, you work your three months or whatever, and then you get your gold watch and then you're off. Yes. You know, there are things that take time to... Uh, you know, sort of, sort of all the stuff you have to do with companies, house, and you know, handing over some clients to to other people. I reckon I'll be done by the end of June. So, the psychological contract, it's kicked in big time. It'll kick in one hundred percent. I reckon from the end of June. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds really good. So, one of the things I noticed in changing tack too, which I thought was really poignant. Yeah was uh, the decision tree that oh, yeah. you have, which yeah. sort of asks some, or, or makes you think about whether it's the right time to yeah. retire. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit more about that, David. Um, well, it, it's an opportunity to, if you're working with somebody or if somebody's reading the book, that you, you can't sheep dip everybody in terms of the same way. Mm. So in terms of this retirement thing, it's a set of questions in terms of have you, have, have you thought this through completely? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you hell bent on retirement as historically understood? Can you financially afford that? Yes. You know, yes. If so, fine, then these are your options. Or if, if you're interested, there's something you've always wanted to do and you don't want to die wondering, you know, <laughs> uh, or you know, are there a couple of things you'd like to do? You know uh, that that kind of top you know give you that little bit of discretionary spend that you maybe need. Yes. Um, yes. You know, which which of these buckets do you fall into? Yes. And then for each of them, coming up with a transition plan. You know, because the transition plan to go the whole hog to retirement, as traditionally understood, would be slightly different to one where you wanted to just do a little bit, do what, keep doing what you're doing, but a little bit less, yeah. or a lot less. Um, do something you've always wanted to do, or have a little kind of range of activities that you want to keep happy yeah. so it was yeah. making sure people had thought about it talked it through and were ready to move move forward and for some people you know they have their they have their heart set on yeah. retirement and there yeah. are a number of things that probably get in the way yeah. which the decision tree really helps you yeah. recognize i think yeah. it really good from, from that point yeah, and, of view it, and it stops i mean there's there's one one of the people who contributed to the uh, to the book because again it's you know 30 lessons I've learned um, and then in, input from 30 other people is somebody who actually said he was busier now he's fully retired he was busy he's busier now than he was when he was working mm, mm, mm. <laughs> but that's yeah. great yeah that's but people really see good. it people see you coming and everybody wants a piece of you yes you know yes. Uh, and this guy was a financial guy so there were lots of charities and different things that, that, that wanted him yeah. uh, and so he's had to work really hard you know, to, you know, not, not 
you know take on too much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. now that makes that makes perfect sense yeah. so uh, I guess I've got a couple of questions I want yeah. to, to finish yeah. with the first is how are you enjoying retirement <laughs> uh, I'm loving it um, I I am very without being smug about it I'm very I've got a great sense of fulfillment that I am managing to actually live out what I had in my mind's eye last year. Right, yeah. Um, and I think one of the key things was that the decision I made, because I actually retired, yeah, my full retirement with a small R, um, <laughs> it was 12 months earlier than I thought it would be, because I was 69 in January and I had planned to do another year. But, you know, I, I pressed the button middle of last year and decided this is right. And the kind of, the, the thing that, I thought about, and the, the analogy I've given people who are surprised that I've done it, yes. was um, in, in, my, in my youth, believe it or not, I was actually quite a good footballer. Mm-hmm. You know, I, represent, mm-hmm. I was captain of my school team, I represented Chester, my city, I represented Cheshire, my county, mm-hmm. uh, I captained my college at Cambridge, I was in the university squad, mm-hmm. uh, and then I played mm-hmm. senior level football down in Sussex when I started work. And I, I realised that that was the highest level I'd ever, I could ever play at, but also, I could, the time I could invest in training was dropping because long days commuting in and out of London and so on. So I, and also that if you got injured, it took you longer to recover. <laughs> and, and so to, in my late twenties, I decided I'm going to quit while I'm playing senior level football in Sussex, rather than going down through from senior to intermediate level to junior level, right. playing for the dog and duck Sunday morning team yes. in the park or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I felt the same with work. I decided, okay. and I was conscious of the, some of the audiences I was having to work with, you know, you, you had to bring your A game every time in terms of the evaluations they gave. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I thought, you know what, I want to quit while, you know, I'm still winning yeah. and while I'm at whatever my peak is and before either Mother Nature or the marketplace say, David, I think you should stop now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that was the really big thing for me. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, happy. Good, excellent. Uh, because I, I noticed in the, in the end of the book, yeah. "Quit While You're Ahead" is one of your yeah. closing yeah. thoughts. Mm. Um, are there are a couple of others there that really stand out. Um, I think keeping the brain active is important, which obviously ties in mm-hmm. with the, the world of neuroscience. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I didn't want the I didn't want to run the risk that the brain thought its job was done and shut down. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want that to be part of my my plan. Yes, um, uh, and I think graceful exiting from things because it wasn't just a case of t- t- making a decision it was telling people and how you told them and the timing of it yeah okay. and being kind of sensitive to that a bit like these two guys i said where i couldn't yes they know i've stopped working with everybody else and they know that they're <laughs> special <laughs> uh, in, a, in a good way yeah um yes so i think that was important and i think um the other one was was learning this discipline of thinking like a pensioner Mm. without turning Mm. into Ebenezer Scrooge, Mm. but just being sensible, you know, about, um, you know, allocating funds and resources. And uh, so, you know, that was important. No, it makes uh, makes perfect sense. Mm. Uh, And just to recap, I think we sort of touched on this throughout our our chat. Who are the books for? So what's the target audience? Uh, Well, for Changing Tap Part 1, it's people who have um want to explore this netherworld between working full time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and stopping yes so whatever that looks like mm-hmm. whether it is, it is just going down to doing less of what they're doing or doing less of what they're doing and something else um so and it's a lot of it is the human stuff you know as opposed to the financial yes, you know, tax yes. pensions and stuff mm-hmm. um and then for the second one changing tax part two um, it's people who could be in that category, but also people who are thinking about retirement for the first time. Yes. And and again, it's to give this supplementary ideas beyond the financial bits as to how they could, uh, the options they have mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. things they need mm-hmm. to think about and advice they need to seek so that they can move forward with the plan that they are com- confident that they can execute. Right. Okay. No, makes makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and David, as always, it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure. I mean, yeah. it, it's great to hear that you're so 
happy in retirement. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely um, loving it. And it's also nice that there's a book out there for me when I reach those uh, those dizzying heights, yeah. hopefully not that far away. Yeah. So thank you. It's been really insightful, been really useful. And yeah. uh, good luck with your retirement. Thank you. And um, we'll catch up again soon. Excellent. Good. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, David. This podcast was brought to you by Prison Brain Mapping, where we believe that self-awareness is the key to the success of every individual and that successful people drive business success. Contact us for more information at prisonbrainmapping.com.